Hello and welcome to another build a -Soil FAQ video. Today, we've got some questions that are pulled from recent videos. Like always, I have no idea what questions are on here. Dean pulled the questions at random. That way, it's completely candid. So let's grab it. Let's start, jump right in. Season four, FAQ number one. First one is from Parrot. Love the videos, dumb question. I don't think it's gonna be a dumb question, let's see. How do you get the worms in the soil to begin with? So I would buy worms, and that's typically the best way. Now there's a few different ways to do this, meaning if you've got, let's say, a four by four bed of soil, and you'd like to add worms to it. Maybe you've got a five gallon pot, and you wanna add worms to it. Do I add the same amount? Do I just hope they show up? A couple things to consider. Worms are expensive, and if you only have one five gallon pot, you only need a few. You can just go down and buy some fishing bait. Very cheap, it's not cost effective when it comes to scale, but you get a few worms that way. And the idea is to introduce a handful of worms. In a five gallon container, maybe five, 10 worms. It doesn't have to be that many. They're going to self-regulate based on the container. They're gonna eat and drink and, well, they're gonna basically exude enzymes and break down the stuff in there, but meaning they're gonna just have this life in your container. But if you put a pound in the five gallon, it might be overdue or overdone and they're gonna escape and run away. They're gonna eat everything in there and it might actually be, like instead of good husbandry to your plant, it might be more like a worm bin. And so what I would advise for most people is set up a worm bin. It can be as simple as just getting like a 15 gallon grassroots fabric pot, or maybe a hundred gallon if you really wanna go crazy. It could be a Rubbermaid tub. I like the pots because they breathe a little bit and they drain moisture out. We have a worm bin that we've done a video on in the past, you can look it up. But when you have a worm bin and you add a few worms or you buy worms, you start to recycle waste in your house, all your food waste, you can have a paper shredder, grind up paper waste. So you feel like you're recycling. It's fun to do with the family. And then you get worms that you can put in your container and you get the worm castings and it just never stops giving. So that's probably the most cost effective way to do it, although it takes a longer time. Otherwise, just buy some worms. Like I said, the best way is to go online, any company, find some red wigglers. You can buy night crawlers. You might find those as fishing bait. I prefer the red wigglers. They're smaller. They tend to work the mulch layer, which is where we want most of our nutrition when it comes to the build a soil way is in the top where the feeder roots are, just like in the forest. Another thing is if you've got a five gallon container and you put five or 10 worms in there, if you don't keep a mulch layer and keep it optimally moist, it might actually, it might be hard to keep them. If the dry down cycle occurs, they could run away or you could kill them. So it seems to be best when you have a little bit larger ecosystem and that's what we're trying to develop in the build a soil way. But it can totally be done in a small container. It just takes more attention. It's like, would you rather have one fish in a cup and having to keep an aquarium or would you rather have something much larger? Well, you'd have to be an expert at pH and food to keep the fish alive in the cup, but it'd be very easy to keep the fish alive in, in a swimming pool, right? So not a dumb question at all. Buy some worms, put them in there. I feel like I little, went a little bit too far with that, but I do love worms and it is an important part of the process because you gotta understand if you're trying to get off bottled nutrients, those are chelated available nutrients. They have to be pH'd properly and then the plant can just take them straight up. When we get into organics, the pH doesn't matter as far as the liquid because they're gonna be taken up a different way the overall pH of all the soil, which is a battery of the calcium and the magnesium and the potassium, it all adds up to the pH. And so once you've got good soil, how do you make the nutrients available? They're not liquid. The worms, the enzymes they produce and the, the nutrient cycling that happens when you top dress. So it's a big, big part of the build a soil way and that's why I wanted to break it down. Okay, Kenzo, next question. Kenzo says, would it be okay to put plant material and buds in your worm bin that have spider mites on them? This is good, it leads right in from the worms, right? You have to think about this a couple ways. If you put materials into your worm bin that are having a known pest that can be a problem to your cash crop and you use fresh castings that's full of life, it's possible you're gonna transmit it. Now spider mites, personally, I don't think would be a problem. But if you put something with thrip in there and thrip are known to live in the soil as opposed to just on the plant, that could be slightly different. Now their life cycle might be broken down and for whatever reason, even without an exact answer, I typically lean towards the solution that the worm bin solves more problems than it creates. And without even having evidence, the worm bin would probably eliminate a lot of the problems if you did compost them with either pathogens or pests on them. But since I can't guarantee it, I would say avoid it. There's not a lot of reason to do it. You don't wanna just continue a cycle. And if your worm bin's in the same room and it's moist and you put it right in there, it's possible there could be some migration. Alternative to that is, if you did want to try it, you could always age the castings afterward by drying them out just a little bit, and that would potentially eliminate any issue. You could also just keep the worm bin separate, do some testing on your own and see what you think. However, when it comes to thrip, which can spread in soil, 
or something that is just something that could just wipe you out. If you're like, man, I had russet mites, should I compost that? Even if the answer is 99% of the time, no, that 1% is way too vulnerable. There's no plan B. Spider mites, I'm like, well, I can knock it back. I don't really care. And so it would be worth justifying the hypothesis to me. But certain things, I just, the risk is too great. So you have to decide for yourself. Meaning, if you have a small grow and you really depend on that, and it's one easy step to just discard the waste and compost something better, I would do that. But if you're not that dependent upon it and you are fascinated by worm bins and curious of what happens, do it. So that's my answer. I personally think it would be no issue, but I don't wanna put that on someone that's really dependent upon it. So worms have been known, you should know, to reduce, to reduce a lot of toxicity. So a lot of times if you take a average local compost and you work it through worms, you're probably a lot safer and it's probably more nutritively available and less toxic to the plants. Oftentimes you'll hear horror, story, horror stories of local composts being tainted by tons of herbicides and fungicides and then everybody who buys that local compost has a terrible year. Don't let that happen to you. You can just work it through the worms or you can buy build, products from Build-A-Soil that are known to be good composts. Or just like if it's a local guy, ask him what he's composting, right? And be, be aware of what can go in there. All right, Darth, next question. Darth says, can you recommend any decent books on bio, uh, biodynamic agriculture? I've been interested in it for a while now. I would say start with the beginning, right? So you could actually look into what biodynamic farming truly is. And you can go back to all of the biodynamic uh, lectures. Look into Steiner and I don't want you to discourage you or encourage you too much. I want you to seek out whatever you'd like, right? Biodynamics seems to be something that a lot of people believe in and also even those that believe in it believe Steiner was a little bit crazy. And what I mean by that is when you read into the lectures, he wasn't really a farmer. He was just somebody who studied earthly energy and would share it through the lectures and then biodynamic farming came out of those lectures of the energy. A lot of it makes sense in the sense that plants are kind of like building a radio tower, receiving the waves of energy from the sun and they're anchoring their energy into the earth. And there is a different energy above and below. And a lot of the things do make sense. But he also talks about Atlantis and Atlanticeans and some of these strange things that seem a little bit cuckoo. But who am I to judge, right? I want you to read about it. And then when you find out that a lot of really good wineries, viticulture, so like a lot of people that grow grapes, they are into biodynamic farming and they seem to get good results from it. But that is akin to, like wine is all about terroir and it's about really utilizing your land. And so when you're doing it properly, they have like silica foliars and you bury this cow's horn to make special compost based on the season. And it goes so much more into the tangible chemistry, even organic chemistry side, and it delves way into the spiritual and the energy side. And a lot of people are attracted to that. But from what you can get directly out of it is that the stirring of the water and the rotation and the chaos, the silica foliar spray from horsetail, some of the compost preps. What's challenging for me is silica is great, compost is great, so it's very hard to find a problem with biodynamic farming. Malibu compost uses biodynamic preps, but it's like, how in the f did they get so much right without knowing? And that has to mean something. And so I encourage you to navigate both sides of that coin and see the craziness for what it's worth and probably that it's not going to make or break you having a crop, but also embrace the fact that they were right about so many things without really knowing why like connect to that and see what it means for you. And then as far as books, just get any book, like go to the Steiner lectures, look them up, they're free, you can research it and that'll give you a kind of a tip into that. But the rest are people's interpretations of that that have evolved. And so once you know that, you can go to the source, make your own interpretations. Hopefully that answers your question. Sorry to go on another rabbit hole, but biodynamic farming is one of those big ones. Okay, Darth, thanks for asking. If you want more detail on this, you guys really like biodynamics, we can do maybe another FAQ on it. I'll bust out a couple of books and we can talk about some of those things, but I honestly think we could talk about it for like a year. And that's why most people go on their own venture and decide how far they wanna go. So Steven, Steven says, do you have any tutorials on how to collect and keep safe pollen from your male plants? No, but it's a good question. We're going to do this sooner rather than later. We've got a lot going on in life right now. I'm trying to take each day by day. We've got a big event coming up. We're gonna go to Canacon. That's coming up soon for us. My wife's gonna go into hip surgery and I'm gonna be gone for a couple of weeks. And then when I get back, I'm gonna be filled with all this creative energy, reading books, taking care of my wife and taking care of our life and just thinking about it without really being able to tinker as much. I'm gonna come back and hit the ground running and we're gonna flip the males to flower. We're gonna collect pollen, we're gonna store it. We're gonna start the veggie tent because I've got an update from Dan at Timber and the new lights that he's gonna be offering as far as actually available in stock. 
lots to talk about. Like I, I want this to be an FAQ, but because of that, I have not done the pollen yet and I don't want to promise anything, but it's going to be coming. And even when we went to Kid Kaya, you may have seen that video, we went to his farm. He brought down his whole pollen box, gifted us some pollen and shows how he has purchased a couple little products to make his life easy when it comes to collecting and storing pollen. So we'll discuss some of those things that I've learned and at least get to the fundamental basics. So look for that coming in the future episodes. All right, next, D-Rob. D-Rob says, you often hear, or you often refer to use Bokashi and soil, but do you ever use your Bokashi juice that you get out of the Bokashi compost? Will it have a similar effect to a ferment? So there's a couple things here. I don't use it, that's why I don't talk about it. And there's a couple of reasons. One is I was taught early on that Anaerobic is the way to go. So when you're using Bokashi, the new buckets have a separated system and they collect the waste underneath and you have like a liquid drain valve for that. But that liquid valve, that liquid area is open to a lot of air. And that's why it is just rank and I do not like using it. It is absolutely disgusting. And I prefer to have a finished ferment that I know. However, I know some people that use it. I pour it down the drain and I feel like I'm helping my septic system. <laughs> or you can just dump it outside. But I think that it's just so gross. I don't like how it adds that much smell to my grow room. I know some of the ferments smell bad, but my Bokashi bin when I've had them in the past were not my favorite. For whatever reason, I just not got fully into it in the sense that I like regular compost, even though it is good. I feel like it's better when I bury it outside and follow the full Bokashi process than try and reutilize the Bokashi composting in the way that it happens in my indoor. And then that liquid that comes off, I just, I know people use it, I just don't, and I'd rather answer the question honestly. So there you go. Let's see, Bill. Bill says, experiencing some PM during mid-flower outdoors in Oregon. Ah, there's lots of powdery mildew out there. I don't wanna overreact or react incorrectly, as Kid Kaya said, right? What do you recommend as an organic approach to correct? So I've always used EM5 if this has happened and we've recommended it to locals, they've experienced good results. Challenge is, is that it has to be used pretty repetitively. It's not something that's gonna completely wipe it out. Others swear by Dr. Zymes and say that's the way to go. Dr. Zymes says that they have tested safe and been safe. And so you can actually take your finished product and dunk it in there to wash the dirt off from an outdoor grow. And their enzyme-based cleaner will help remove that funk so you don't have dead bugs and dirt all over your herbs. That goes the same with powdery mildew and they say it's safe in flower. I have noticed these enzyme sprays, when you use them, can burn the pistols on your plant. And it seems like either they grow out of it or they get used to it and it's not so, so damaging to them but the only way to find out is to ramp it up slowly. And when you've got PM, I would rather start on the low end, foliar spray and ramp it up a little bit. And when you've got something that's um, bad with the enzymes, they say to use like 90 degree water, reverse osmosis, make sure the enzymes in that doctor's enzymes are fully active before you spray it to get rid of the powdery mildew. So that would be my advice. EM5 is my personal go-to because it seems to be really, really gentle. EM5 has organic apple cider vinegar, organic peppermint oil, organic grain, uh, grape alcohol, and so I think that alcohol and the vinegar kind of cut through and really do help wash it off. At minimum, it discourages it from growing, which means that it's not gonna be an issue when it comes to actually finishing harvest, especially if it's isolated. So consider that for what it's worth. I do like to, once I've sprayed it down with EM5 really well, defoliate all the leaves that seem to have been a problem and get rid of them, and then continue sprays after that. You can do it every day for a few days. You can do it every couple of days. Some people just do it once a week. If you know you've got an issue, I'm more likely to spray it down a few days in a row to really discourage that anchor that it gets in the plant. On the leaf, the powdery mildew t tends to get anchors into the leaf like in it and live on it and then grow from it. So if you just wash it off, it's still got its anchor. It's like pulling a weed from the yard. You can't just cut the top off, it regrows. So even though we can't pull the roots out, the EM5 kind of cuts through. And if you do it multiple times, it really discourages the growth. There are a number of other products you can get that are labeled for that use. So EM5 is more my recommendation because it cleans the plant. And since I know it has vinegar and alcohol and things that clean, it's perfect for that. And I know that the very small amounts of material when you dilute it, they off gas, the peppermint's so volatile. It doesn't, it doesn't add any odor. It doesn't ruin your herb in any way. So at least trust me on that. You can spray up until harvest with it to fight the PM. It's not ideal but I would rather you learn that, hey, when you're up against something that is, can be disgusting and dangerous, I would rather you spray and get rid of it and do whatever it takes. And I don't like spraying flowers, but the EM5 has been so gentle for me when diluted. You know, an ounce or two per gallon is totally safe. I've had people even do three, four ounces on full flowering plants without any issue and really discourage the powdery mildew. And you will not see a decline in the quality from what I can tell. Outside, I mean, they're getting rained on and they're getting bugs and dirt. In fact, a lot of times it can wash it almost like cleaning your golf ball. Gives you a little bit smoother surface to get that distance out of. When your leaves are actually receiving the sun and they're not dusty and everything's nice, 
I feel like you're gonna have good results. So I hope it works out for you. Obviously you don't wanna smoke that powdery mildew. You wanna get rid of it. Then when you know you have a problem, like you're spraying for something that's known, when it comes to harvest, you need to be a lot more detailed when it comes to inspection. So you have to kind of take your own health into consideration, do some research and take it for what it's worth. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. All right, last question on here is from Mid Gardens. Is the root interaction of the cover crop affecting the terpene production of the cannabis plant itself? Could this be a reason not to chop and drop the cover crop? Uh, no, in fact, it'd probably be the opposite. So when we think of terpene expression, it's kind of like a lot of the plant's defense system come from potentially knowing harm is there. And the plants don't have feet. They can't just get up and run away. They have to activate their own internal defense system. So when we are chopping and dropping cover crop, the plants are probably like, oh my gosh, there's plants dying near me. What's going on? Maybe I should put up my defenses. This is how people found out that jasminic acid released by the sage when an animal steps on it and chomps it actually really increases the trichome development in tomato plants or in tobacco plants. And so there's clear relationships about what elicits that response from the plants. And there's products that are actually sold to do that. I think the cover crop could be a key component of that interaction. I also think the chopping and dropping of it could signal those stress responses that we're after without actually stressing our plant. So I don't have any guarantees on that. It's just that the logic does apply. And so I want you to think of it that way. When we can kind of positively stress the plants, getting them as strong as possible, it's like working a human out and getting there and attend. Like you wanna be in the cold, you wanna be working hard, you wanna do things that are hard and that's how you become the strongest. Same for your plants. I think you could chop and drop and Either way, I know it works positively to have the cover crop and that interaction. So this has been great. I really like answering all these questions. If you wanna hear your question answered as part of our season four FAQ, be sure to be interactive in our YouTube videos, ask the questions. Of course, if you wanna be way more interactive, you could jump into the Patreon. We've got a Discord group, some other fun stuff happening, but these videos will always be free and we'll always be here for the community regardless. So thanks for watching. And until next time, I'll see you guys on the next FAQ episode.